there's an increasing sense among the academics. So that includes Thomas and Christine Farley and, and myself that there's a, a quite major issue lurking in the DLT. Um, and we've kind of raised this before, but we're starting to get some more empirical, you know, data of, of really how it affects. And the, the core issue is the most important provision within the whole DLT, which is Article 3, which, as you know, creates a closed list of disclosures that can be required in an application. And so then one must ask, you know, what's not included? And, you know, the developing countries have already identified, well, this doesn't include traditional cultural expressions, genetic resources, all these kind of things. But there's actually a number of other policies um, that are bound up here, too. And I think it really starts from something um, Margot Bagley introduced when she came and addressed the group, if you recall. And she said, you know, I'm a patent inventor. And Margot is a patent professor, utility patents, you know, the kinds of patents that pharmaceuticals get. But in many countries, including the United States, um, design protection is effectuated through patent law. Not Sometimes there could be an independent design law, and it may really focus on you know, creative, you know, visual aspects, aesthetics, whatever, but actually design patents often are about machines. And they're there, you can often get a design patent on the exact same invention that you get a utility patent for. And and Margot mentioned this when they file a patent, they file for a utility patent, also file for a design patent. It's a little bit easier to get a design patent, and there's not as much international structure around how long a design protection can be, et cetera. But in countries that implement design protection through patent rights, it's a similarly strong protection. You know, so if you think of trademarks at the one side, and honestly, when I came into this field, I thought, ah, oh, design law, it's more like trademarks. It's more aesthetics. You know, it's, it's more something you're communicating. Um, but it's actually that's actually not true, right? And and Jamie had some examples, and maybe Jamie, you can get those ready. I don't have that slide with you, but examples of of um, things that receive design patents just in the United States, and they look like inventions, and they receive a very similar kind of um, of exclusivity, which is to exclude others from making that invention. So it's a much stronger. Um, kind of exclusivity than we think about um, for for trademark law, for instance. And I raise those two, of course, because the major uh, precedents for the design law treaty are either the trademark law treaty or the patent law treaty. But those two treaties are very different on this issue. So the the trademark law treaty uh, has this closed list of things that can be due in the application, but the patent law treaty does not. And one can think of those as linked to the much stronger policy um, objectives that exist in the patent field. I mean, where you're really excluding not just somebody from branding something like you did, but actually from competing in the market. And that's that's a much uh, has much stronger economic and, and development impacts. And so it, one might want to be thinking more about patent law as you're as you're going into this DLT trading than, than design laws. It's not just um, about aesthetics. This is the language on the patent law treaty on applications, and it does not have that same information in the DLT that says you can't have any other information in the application. This language is a little hard to weave around because it requires that you go and look at the um, patent cooperation treaty, you see the, the form and contents, you know, you, you may only have what's allowed by the PCT, but if you read the PCT, there are not there are not restrictions on, the, on what's in an application in the PCT. And then importantly, part two in the request form, it says that a contracting party may actually have its own form and it may require further contents in that form. So in the patent field, you can have, even though you have the PCT and international applications, you can have your own application requirements that require different disclosures um, than, than is in the international application. Trademark law treaty, more like the design law treaty. 
you know, so this is clearly the language that was adopted, right? You may have some of the following, in, uh, some or all of the following elements. And then here it's paragraph seven in the DLT, it's paragraph two. Um, you may not have other requirements. And then if you notice, actually, in the trademark law treaty, there's some interesting language that Christine Farley referred to in a previous meeting, but they actually spell out what they're concerned about. And, you know, as we move towards solutions, you know, you could imagine actually refashioning this thing. And if there's parts of the design law treaty that people really don't want to be in an application, you could spell those out and have a closed list of things that aren't included instead of a closed list of things that can be included. But we'll get to that in solutions. You know, so this is the DLT draft. Of course, it follows that TLT draft, the trademark law treaty. It has the summer all language, and then it has a prohibition of additional elements, but it doesn't have a specific list of what kind of things countries are really concerned about in making that a closed list. So we don't know what those things are very specifically. Okay, so that's that's the framework, right? To think about there's you know design law treaty, patent law treaty are two possible precedents, but they deal with this issue very differently. So we know about the traditional cultural expressions issue, which we've been talking about a long time, but here's some information that Jamie released yesterday, and he's do doing a paper on this that we'll publish before the negotiation, and we'll hand it out, and we'll probably do a, a workshop on this issue to really make sure that all countries are exposed to it. But so this is U.S. law. So U.S. law has a short statement of what should be in the application, but paragraph three is not included in the current DLT text, a statement regarding federally sponsored research or development. So in, in the U.S., the U.S. government has rights vis-a-vis -a, -vis a different part of the statute, so-called Bayh-Dole Act, has rights in U.S. government inventions and designs. You know, these things are treated the same. And so if a design is 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 sponsored by the government in the U.S., the government has more rights um, to to use that invention and, and even take over that invention in case of abuse, et cetera. So, there's, so it requires disclosure of that information in the application. Artificial intelligence is a new hot topic, right? I mean, so the one can define kind of the wave of, of policy in this area is, is to deny protection for artificial intelligence in, um, created inventions or designs. Now, we may not care about this in the trademark con context. Like, do, may, we might not care if a brand was created by AI because you're giving such a narrow right there. You're just giving the opportunity to prevent consumer confusion. So we might not care if McDonald's has a new brand that's created by AI, right? But an invention gives a much stronger right. And so we do care. But artificial intelligence is not included in, in Article 3 of, of the DLT. There's a bunch of other issues. And again, Jamie's paper is kind of outlining these, but you know, licenses of right. So this is applicable patents. Many countries have laws that say you can get a patent. And at the same time, as you're applying for the patent, you can indicate, it's often like a checkbox, that I want this to be available for all users as long as they pay me a royalty. It's like a voluntary compulsory license, like a voluntary statutory license. So you're opening up, anybody may use that. Um, it's similar to standard essential patents, you know, but that those might not always be voluntary. But if you have a design that creates a real blockade um, in a particular kind of technology, it's very, some, it's very common in cell phones, for instance, um, then you can open and collectives can come together and decide to do this, or sometimes they can be ordered but you can open those blocking patents to use by anyone in the field and it, it liberates the it liberates the field right so that everybody can still make that phone and use that design but the holder gets paid but you would normally put that um, in an application potentially we i think brazil raised you know how do we do gender tracking and and things like that um, so countries may want to have request information in the application to serve alternative um, alternative policies, not necessarily for eligibility, but to just to track this information, et cetera. Of course, we've talked about the TCEs. You know, when you think about 
designs as being more like patents. I think the answer to why genetic resources is there is more clear. I mean, the whole treaty that you all just negotiated was about disclosure of genetic resources in patent applications. Well, design our patent applications in many countries. So I think you, you really do need to include that if that's, um, you know, the international policy as the previous treaty, you know, indicated. Characteristics of the applicant. I mean, you, you might want to know whether it's a small or large business, whether it's a local or foreign business, et cetera. And that could be for fee waivers or, you know, adjustments or an issue that Jamie raised um, the other day. What about litigation or invalidations or things like that? I mean, you might want to know that this design was not judged to be creative in the U.S. or France or whatever before they start submitting the application. So it's just a huge amount. Of, I'm sure we could expand this list, which is really the problem. So the problem with closed lists is that they require you to think of all the different needs now, you know, as you're negotiating the, the treaty. And if it doesn't have an opening clause, then it's, then you have to have a means to change that over time, which of course there is, you know, so po possible solutions. Uh, and this would be my last slide and, and maybe we can give Jamie a couple minutes or I don't know how much time we have, but um, so one is you could just delete article three, two, you know, so if you, if you went back to the, the language in DLT, Article 3.1 is, is not unambiguously a closed list. I mean, it says you can have some or all of the following. It doesn't say you can only have some or all of the following. And I, I think a natural interpretation of that is that it's not necessarily closed. But the, the, clo the closure comes in to prohibition of other requirements. No indication other than those may re be required. So it's possible that deleting that, you know, so you might can... Consider whether you support that language, which is the language that adds the closure to the list. The, the list may still serve some functions. It gives an indication to, to design law um, applicants that most likely these are going to be the things that are going to exist in application, but it won't be a closed list. I mean, that other, other countries can add things to that, to that list, for instance. Or you could have a more open opening clause. Um, one place to do that might be in what's currently Article 10, which says that you can op that it's only open through items that are added in the regulation. So maybe something that says, you know, further indication or element required by domestic law. So this is language similar to what India has proposed in Article 5. So it's just to say, okay, if it's if it's in some other place in the law. So if our government use provision requires that you disclose, if our traditional cultural expression law requires that you disclose, then you can require that in the application as well. Or you could, you know, and I think this one's the hardest, but you could expand the regulations because right now the point 10 in Article 3 says you can include other items that are mentioned explicitly in the regulations. So you could hammer those out in the regulations. You could try to include this list in the regulations um but this list was created yesterday you know like as i think christine mentioned in the uh apg meeting yesterday you know a lot of this dlt has not been something that a lot of people have really been focusing on in a high level of expertise and a lot of us are just kind of coming into the space now and one finds a lot of policy issues kind of hidden in this text so i think I think that concludes where we are. Again, this, this issue is pretty new. And thank you to Jamie and KEI for really digging deep in here and exposing it. And I think, you know, the upshot is I think it, it exposes, you know, potentially a larger kind of important flaw in the current design that doesn't seem to be receiving a whole lot of attention, which is, you know, what's the real impact of having um, a closed list in Article 3 um, and what are the different ways that that one might might want to open it? Thank you, Sean. It's really clear from the uh, the notes that provided by the secretariat on the treaty that they consider it to be 
a very important component of the agreement that they limit the elements that you can require in an application. And they say for, for uh, efficiency and things like that. So they, they see that as a feature that they limit things. They do provide in this, uh, uh, this one non-bracketed um, sub-paragraph, uh, I think Article 3, 1A, uh, uh, Roman, Roman numeral X, that you can add elements to uh, through the regulations. So uh, if you look at the treaty provisions on the regulations, they, they, they say in current draft that you have to have like a three quarter majority to change the regulations. And some regulations can be specified that they can only be changed by uh, uh, unanimously. So it's not that easy to change uh, regulations. The EU also wants to be able to vote as a bloc. Uh, uh, so right now they're like 27 member states. So that would, as a practical matter, make it highly likely that the EU could block any changes in the regulations that they did not agree with. So. Uh, I think it's pretty consequential if you have a close list. I don't think it'll be that easy to add things. I'm not saying it's impossible. Obviously, one thing they're going to argue about is is uh, the origins of of designs and uh, and traditional knowledge and cultural expressions, which is bracketed in the text right now. And one of the alternatives, of course, is you can add, you can add that later to regulations. But point Sean was making, I think, is more important: is that do you really want to have a a closed list because the list goes to things you're not allowed to require to to grant protection. So it really it really restricts what flexibility you have. I first started looking at it in the context of government funded inventions because this is an area where we have done a lot of work where the U.S. government has rights in utility patents like on drugs, vaccines, medical devices, things like that, and you're required. You disclose that on in the application and on the um, published patent. And the publishing of that information on the patent and in the application is really important because if you don't, if uh, some of the rights are for the government, but some of the rights are for the public. For example, uh, any member of the public can, can, can challenge the exclusivity of a patent on the basis they don't think that benefits are available to the public on reasonable terms. And there's some other conditions as well. But if you don't know that that right exists in the patent, it, it, it would you know it, it would be kind of a meaningless uh, uh, right, or it'd be much much less useful. Now, uh, when when the design treaty came up, I, I wasn't quite sure if that it did apply to design patents as well as utility patents. But it, in fact, it does apply, and you can you can find in the regulations for uh, uh, acquiring um, a design patent protection in the United States. There's a, there's actually one element in the regulations which requires you to make a statement of whether the government has an interest. I put in the chat a search term you can use on Google Patents. It will give you uh, several patents that have these disclosures made. So you can not only see what the disclosure looks like in a design patent in the United States, but you can also look at the types of patents. And as Sean mentioned, these government-funded designs are often for things like medical devices, solar panels, there's a lot of them on arms. There's a, uh, it could be spare parts for things. They, they, they're not uh, just pretty pictures. So I think, I think they're, they're quite important. The other thing is that the, uh, the, the WIPO Committee Understanding um, Committee of Trademarks Designs, they've been asked by uh, a group of countries, a very large group of countries, to have a joint recommendation at WIPO that countries extend design protection to graphical user interfaces on software. An additional area that we've thought of, in addition to government funding that you might want disclosure on, is whether or not design has an implication about a standard. And the one example that I you know, was really interested in at first was emergency room uh, care, where the idea on a graphical user interface for standards would be to ensure that if you switch machines from different manufacturers and you were trying to train a staff and you had turnover, that you would be able to have kind of a consistent way of presenting some information 
to healthcare workers dealing in an emergency room situation in a high stressful situation where you want to reduce the uh, 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 the demands on their cognitive ability while they're working in there. And there's lots of other examples. I think that some of the examples people give us whether or not you have um, particular designs for the charging devices for electronic vehicles and whether or not that's an additional type of protection other than a utility patent. So just reinforcing what Sean and other academics have said that that many of these design patents, uh, not all of them, but many of the design patents really have a pretty consequential impact on some uh, some uh, industrial uh, application. And we looked at other areas too. I, I think it was interesting that Sean brought up gender. It's something I hadn't really thought about, but certainly the U.S. government and the uh, and the European Union they publish these uh, reports from time to time on the impact of the IP system. Uh, and different parts of the IP system, including trademarks, designs, patents, everything, on employment or GDP or things like that, or wages. And it is true that uh, the proposal does, you, does you allow you to, to have other types of agencies request information separate from the uh, request for protection. But uh, it, it, it's, it's much, much more problematic if the requests for information come outside of the IP system. If the request is made in connection with the protection itself, it is by far and away the most powerful way to get the information you want. If you wait for a competition commission to make an inquiry, which it does once in a blue moon, and typically uh, these things are confidential, the request for information, Statistics are often blinded in such a way, and it's a burdensome thing to. It's very, it's very difficult to collect information from for, uh, from statistical authorities, and and there's all very severe limits to what you can make public. That's true, certainly with tax authorities. So there, the, the fact in the in in the notes to the proposal prepared by the secretary, they try and kind of wave their hands a bit and say, "Don't worry about it. You can't ask these things in applications." But there's, you know, you 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 have the opportunity to ask for information outside of the applications. One thing we highlighted was in Article 15 of the basic proposal on the recording of a, uh, a security interest or a license. There's a specific prohibition that you can't ask for information dealing with the financial terms uh, of the agreement. We've also focused uh, uh, separately on on the idea that in some countries that have patents and and protect designs for patents and things like that but not only for patents, but for copyright or for trademarks and other types of IP, quite a few countries implement what they call a license of right program, where the person getting the protection makes an election to pay a lower amount of fees for the uh, the granted protection or the, re the registered protection. But in return for that, they give up the right to exclude people from using um, the right that they have. So their IP right then is available to anyone. And if they can't negotiate a license uh, bilaterally, then they give up the right to have a third party off in the patent office uh, or some other uh, I, uh, third party is established by statute can actually uh, gr and grant the license themselves in what they consider to be reasonable terms. So for, for these systems to work too, it's also really helpful to kind of understand what are reasonable terms? What's going on? And to the extent that there's more and more uh, interest in having more transparency in the IP system, knowing what um, reasonable uh, compensation is, what reasonable remuneration is, knowing who the beneficial owners are um, in, in practice, uh, knowing more about uh, 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 how, how, what's the relationship between licensing and employment and domestic manufacturing, things like that. This whole range of public interest things that are are, are, are quite important that you might want to deal with. Uh, the, the, the AI example that Sean mentioned is something that we've been very interested in. And I, I, I think people are probably aware of the fact that, that every IP office in the world right now is trying to figure out how to deal with generative AI. And uh, a typical thing that's going on uh, is, is like in the United States right now, in both the patent in the copyright area, there's guidance out that requires a duty to disclose uh, to the extent that uh, 
uh, AI tools are used in the creation of a protected uh, a, a, a protected thing, like whether it's a design, whether it's a utility patent, or whether it's a copyright. And it's astonishing to me that in 2024, um, uh, disclosures relating to the role of AI are not included uh, at, uh, on the list. I mean, they, it's something that I think everyone wants. It's clearly in a direction for more transparency people are looking at. They want to have transparency on the IP, both in terms of whether or not they qualify for protection, which is one thing that's clearly part of the, the treaty, but also they may want to have disclosures of the role of the AI in the creation when they look at issues like remunerating the people whose data was used to train the AI. So that's that doesn't go to whether or not you grant the protection. In terms of the AI, to really emphasize, because I think this is really timely and important for people to talk about, and I think it will get attention of people um, at the diplomatic conference. Uh, there's two primary areas people are looking at in terms of transparency on the AI front. One, do they grant protection at all? And that usually goes to the extent to which the AI tool was used in the creation of the invention, the design, or the copyrighted work. The second thing, though, which is totally separate from whether you grant protection or not, is whether or not you have an obligation to compensate the people whose works were used or, or the right owners whose works were used to train the AI. And those are really important questions on both the input side of AI and the output side. And what you have right now is a straitjacket where you would have to get three quarters of the members of the people that vote to agree to, uh, to, to include that as an element that you would require in an application. And, and what's more, if this treaty goes through, here's what's going to happen is like people uh, are not going to be able to amend the, uh, uh, the regulations at all for some time because they'll, they'll have to like uh, have countries join the treaty. And that takes a long time. And then you have to have a sufficient number of people to join the treaty for the treaty to go into effect. Like there's a certain number of countries that have to ratify it before it even becomes an instrument. And that's going to take years. And in the meantime, people that are modifying their laws uh, so they can actually be consistent with the treaty are going to do it with, with, with the benefit of zero regulation changes because it will be impossible to change the regulations until you actually ratify it and the treaty goes into effect. So you're going to stall people with this outdated, highly restrictive list right now without any real possibility for, for several years to be able to make any changes to it through regulation changes. So I think what you, you really have to attack is whether you should have a closed list at all. And if your fallback position is to make it less closed than it is, well, good luck with that. I think you should try that. But I think it's an extremely important issue. And I think it has uh, uh, significant consequences on your policy space, not just uh, uh, not just transparency for transparency's sake, which itself I like, but I think it also goes to the kind of policies and evaluation of policies that you're able to do. Thank you.